Hello, thank you everyone. I'm really thrilled to have this opportunity to talk about something I feel passionate about. And as Mariam said, I'm going to be talking about health and connectivity. I'm an epidemiologist, so we're interested in treating large numbers of people, so it's public health. And I can show you that mobile technology can actually transform lives just using a telephone. When I was growing up in Zimbabwe, we would turn on the television, occasionally it would be on, and there'd be images of Africa, and that image was always a cry around hunger. Now the cry isn't about hunger so much, it's more about connectivity. The connectivity revolution that is transforming Africa, that is transforming Asia as we speak. 77% of Africa is connected. And by the end of last year, more than 640 million mobile phone subscriptions had happened in Africa. That's a big number, considering there's 7 billion people in this world. And interestingly, that connectivity isn't just about cities. It's happening in rural areas. And I can tell you that in rural Zimbabwe, I have fewer communications blank spots than I have in rural Britain. <laughs> you see here, there's a grandmother, grandchildren, they're in a village. Now that village might not have running water, it probably doesn't have electricity, and I'm pretty certain that phone is probably solar charged. But actually, they're still connected. A few days ago, when I was back in Zimbabwe, the buzz, interestingly enough, was about what was happening in Davos. People knew about Davos. And the fact that they knew about Davos was, was what came out from the Oxfam report, that 1% of the world, the very rich, own 50% of the world's wealth. Wow. That's amazing. 1% own 50% of the world's wealth. Now, it gets you thinking, doesn't it? Shouldn't we be deploying our resources, our connectivity, for the betterment of all of humankind, not just a few? How can we do this? Well, it's starting to happen because of the need. I'll give you an example of what is happening around financial services. Before we do that, I want to ask a question. How many of you use your phone to pay for groceries, telephone banking, all sorts? Please put up your hands, quick straw poll. Mm, that's, that's quite a few people, but it's not everyone. If we were in Nairobi or Harare, pretty much everyone would be putting up their hand. And I'll tell you why. Before that, only about 10% of people had access to financial services. So almost, well, most people were not banked at all. And yet last year, be it in Impesa or the phenomenon called EcoCash in Zimbabwe, many transactions happened through the phone. In Zimbabwe alone, in 2014, $4 billion worth of money passed through mobile phones. And for such a small country, that's a big part of the GDP. That's amazing, isn't it? Imagine that, $4 billion. It gets me thinking, if we can do this for financial services, if we can transform people by including them, people who in the past would have to just keep their money under a mattress. Now they keep it on their phone and they keep their phones with them. So a phone is no longer just for talking. A phone is much more than that. You can use it to transact. Take a leap and think, how can we use it for health? There are big problems in health. 
For example, in India, 27% of people live in, um, in urban areas, but they have 75% of the infrastructure. That doesn't sound right. So the need and the service are just not matched. Now that's because the qualified doctors, understandably, don't want to be out in a remote village serving people where there's no running water, there's no electricity. They want to be in the cities. So what do we do? Do we build more hospitals? Do we physically force them to move to rural areas? We've been trying to create incentives, but they just haven't been working because they all want to be in the cities. But if we think out of that, off the box and think, what can we do? Well, why don't we, rather than taking them physically from the city, why don't we take them virtually from the city? And that's what mobile health is about. Using that communications network, that 3G, 4G network that's deployed pretty much all around the world, why don't we use that to deliver health services? I'll give you an example of the work that we're doing at the moment. Many of you, in fact, almost everyone in this room, I'm sure, has heard of the Ebola epidemic that started out in Guinea, quickly spread through to Liberia and Sierra Leone. It's still happening now. There were many mistakes made, but a big component was lack of information. People just didn't know what measures needed to be done. And yet, I said, more than 630 million people have phones. So we're a bit behind, but what we've done We've set up a platform, a health information platform, that we're using to deliver health information on Ebola for prevention across Africa. So it's the Stop Ebola campaign. So to, we can send this information to millions of, of subscribers and with a simple message, wash your hands. You, you can save someone's life, literally. Wash your hands with soap and water. It will save your life. And we didn't have to move to do that. We just pressed a button, it reached millions of subscribers. So we've spoken about this flow of information, but let's move beyond that and think about flow of medicines, flow of healthcare goods. And we don't have to invent new ways of doing this. We can use existing systems. I'll give you an example of what we're doing. Again, actually, this is happening in, in Zimbabwe, where we're actually using the mobile base station or mobile tower, you know, the tower that sends the signal. It has to be powered in some way, and it's always powered, because if it's down, communications are, are down, that means money, so it's in the company's interest to keep that going. But what we're doing is we're tapping into that power to actually run vaccine fridges in rural areas, the same rural areas that wouldn't have electricity, can now have a cold chain. So measles vaccines, typhoid vaccines are now stored. So life-saving vaccines. So we now have this chain where we can communicate to pregnant mothers so we can keep them up to date on what they need to do for a healthy pregnancy. Once the baby is born, we can also give them information and reminders about immunization. They can go to their nearest um, uh, health center, which is remote, but which has a working fridge because it's, it's actually powered. Um, and there you have an example of a nurse who's actually communicating with somebody who's located elsewhere. It could be a reminder, come in for a health check, you are now six months pregnant, or it could be you have to bring your child in. And there, you will see the mothers come in, and we've actually found that when the mothers receive the reminders, 97% of the time, they turn up on time for the vaccinations of their child. They just needed to be reminded. And there, in the middle, you have the example of a fridge that's powered by that base station. 
and there's the little child having the vaccination, which is painful, but it saves their life. And this is happening in one country, but you can go anywhere in the world and you can talk on the phone. So why are we not doing this in many other countries? We can be saving lives, even as we speak, by these simple measures that are using existing technology. And then, if we move actually beyond that and think there's more we can be doing, why can't we revolutionize healthcare as we know it? I'll tell you about a project that I'm working on that is to establish hubs, healthcare hubs, in rural settings where there's some people who have never interacted with a doctor or any other professional uh, medical person but we want to bring that to them without having to move that professional. For example, you may have a fever in a remote area. Your village healthcare worker with just a few drops of blood, a smartphone, can tell you whether you have malaria. It's happening now. It's the current, it's not even the future, it's the present. And that is our future. By 2020, more than 90% 90, 90 of Africans over six will have a phone. Isn't that amazing? And this is the so-called developing countries. We hear about queues and accident emergency, the National Health Service is overburdened. We have to think about new ways of transforming it. Long waiting surgeries. But maybe we should start to look south and think, what's happening in Africa? What's happening in India? There are about 1,150 mobile health projects throughout the world. 40% of those are in Africa. What lessons can we learn? Because it should be a revolution for the whole world. It should be possible if you're in the Scottish Highlands or you're in a, a Namibian farmer to have access to healthcare, to have access to health information. It's up to us to push for that, to make sure that the digi digital revolution that is here in health happens now. Thank you.